Daniel chapter 1 is where we are. Uh, I'm going to read starting at verse 8 down through verse 21. Picking up where we left off last week. Daniel chapter 1 starting at verse 8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearances be examined before you and the appearances of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh, that just means healthy looking, not gaunt, than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that that, that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. And thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, by the way, that last sentence there just simply tells us that uh, Daniel had a very long and prolific career working there in the king's palace until the reign of King Cyrus. So Daniel's going to um, be employed there, serve there, work there, uh, and during the reign of four or five kings, and God's going to use him to really be influential here in the palace. So we're going to pick up where we left uh, last, pick up where we left off last week, and study through some of these things into the rest of chapter one and into chapter two. But let's first have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you for meeting us here time and again, where two or more are gathered. Here you are in our midst. And Lord, I thank you for all those who are here today and those who are watching online. And we just want to offer all of our worship to you, all of our praise and adoration, because you are exalted, Lord, and you are high and lifted up in this place. We worship you. And we ask now that you would speak to our hearts through the pages of this ancient text with all of its timeless truth. And we love you and we praise you together. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. And everybody said, amen. In 606 BC, thousands of Jews were taken as prisoners of war by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon And then they were subsequently deported all the way from Jerusalem, the 900 miles or so, to Babylon, located along the Euphrates River in what is modern Iraq. Among the thousands of Jews who were taken as prisoners uh, were Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Uh, Daniel becomes the primary character in this book that bears his name. He was the one inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things. So we're, we're looking at his life, or we're looking at life at least through his lens. And um, there he is now, living in Babylon, uh, taken forcibly from his country, from his people. Uh, most scholars, as I mentioned last week, believe that Daniel and his friends were around the age of 15 when they were first taken as exiles to Babylon. And the Babylonians, as I said last week, they did not treat their prisoners of wars, uh, uh, their, their prisoners of war inhumanely. They treated them actually by, uh, by being merciful to them. 
by bringing them to Babylon and then sub- seducing them with the wonder and the beauty and the opulence of ancient Babylon, which again was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So you'd come into Babylon wide-eyed and wearied after a long journey across much of what was desert, and you would come into a very beautiful and wealthy and spacious place, and eventually the Babylonians would attempt to indoctrinate you with their language, their literature, their customs, their practices, and even the worship of their God, uh, God's plural, I should say, until you behaved like them, thought like them, believed like them, worshiped like them. That was their tactic. So they didn't mistreat their prisoners of war. They, they just seduced you and assimilated you into the Babylonian culture. But among those Jews taken captive, these four guys, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, determined that though they were in Babylon, Babylon wouldn't get in them. And they were going to live lives that were distinct for God. They knew who they were in the Lord. And for that reason, they refused to compromise They refused to allow the culture and the environment to shape them, to mold them. And and because they knew who they were, though they had been forcibly taken from everything familiar to them, their families, their homeland, their language, the worship of their God in the temple of Jerusalem, uh, they continued to stand strong in their faith and their values and their principles. They honored God. They glorified Him in their lives. And so what we find here in chapter 1 is that these four guys were chosen from among a select group to be trained to go into a three-year training program for the purpose of preparing them for service in the king's court. And so these guys were selected, and they enter into this like three-year training program. And at the end of the three years, they come out the top of their class, so much so that when they are examined by King Nebuchadnezzar, when King Nebuchadnezzar examines the graduating class. He says about these four guys in verse 20, we read it a moment ago in verse 20, that they are 10 times better than anyone else in matters of wisdom and understanding. So God had blessed them. And and what we see happening here in the lives of these four guys, and with Daniel in particular, is that when you stand strong in the Lord, and when you know who you are in Him, And when you therefore live a life that honors and glorifies God, He will take care of you, He will bless you, and He will use you. We see this in their lives here. These guys were committed to stand strong in a world that was constantly assaulting their faith, their values, and their principles. They weren't going to compromise. And as a result of living a life that honored God and glorified Him, God took care of them, God blessed them, and God used them. David would say something similar in Psalm chapter 18, verses 24 to 27, when he wrote this. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. To the faithful, you, Lord, show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure. But to the crooked, you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. So David even writes similarly in Psalm chapter 18. Listen, when you live for the glory of God, you live a blameless life, God will be blameless unto you. You live a faithful life, God is faithful unto you. You live a pure life, God is pure unto you. You live a crooked life, it doesn't go well for you. And so God honors those who live a righteous life. He honors and blesses them and uses them for His glory. And Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael were, as as I just read from the words of David in Psalm 18, they were faithful, they were blameless, they were pure, they were humble. And so let me show you what God did for them as a result, how, how faithfulness was rewarded in their lives and how God took care of them and blessed them and used them. The first thing... Uh, that God gave them in terms of rewarding their faithfulness, number one was influence, influence. Still here in chapter one, look again in verse nine, where it says, now God had brought Daniel into the favor, circle that word, and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs, whose name, by the way, earlier in chapter one is Ashpenaz. So it just simply says there in verse nine that Daniel brought, that rather God brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of his boss. I mean, the chief of the eunuchs, Ashpenaz, he was like the commanding officer. Daniel and his friends were recruited into this training program. It was a three-year boot camp. And so Ashpenaz is giving oversight to all of these guys, these young men who are being trained in this three-year program. 
And Daniel makes a special request of Ashpenaz. And he basically says to him, listen, you know, you may have heard about the Daniel fast, you know, the Daniel diet, Ashpenaz, and it's a really popular thing, you know, right now. And uh, how, how many of you heard of the Daniel fast and like the Daniel diet? Okay, some of you have. It's like, it's like, what profit diet are people going to come up with next? You know, it's like, and this is Daniel fast. Are you, are, you, and are you eating Ezekiel bread? Ezekiel bread. Make sure you eat Ezekiel bread and the Daniel fast. It'll go well for you. You know, such fashionable diets, these. Are you keto? Are you keto? Or are you paleo? What are you? Paleo or keto? Ezekiel bread? Daniel fast? What in the world? People ask me sometimes, Pastor G, what diet are you on? I'm on the seafood diet. <laughs> if I see food, I'm eating it. That's what I'm doing. So Daniel comes to Ashpenaz and he says, listen, 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 I don't want all the king's food here. Now, he had a reason because he's a young Jewish boy and it's not kosher. All the king's food, this is Babylon. And the Babylonians worship false gods and they offered food and wine to these false gods and then they would eat it and drink it. Daniel, knowing this, says, it's against my conscience. This stuff isn't kosher. I can't eat it. Plus, it's probably not good for you, you know. And here's this spread of all this wonderful food, you know, pulled pork barbecue and, and uh, you know, and grits and mashed potatoes and uh, bacon, you know, and all this, and des all the dessert table was incredible. Banana cream pie, tiramisu, chocolate pudding. I mean, it's just like, and, and all these things. And, and then the wine, you know, and Daniel goes, you know what? Uh, can't eat this stuff. And so he makes a special request of Ashpenaz. Now, Ashpenaz says to him, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The king has given you all of his wonderful delicacies and you're telling me you don't want to eat this. Do you know, if you don't eat this and you don't look, you know, if I don't present you ripped and, and, you know, ready and smart and savvy, the king's going to have my head. So you're going to have to eat the king's food. And Daniel's like, I don't eat the king's food. It's not good for me. Please, would you reconsider? Well, actually what happens is, look at verse 14. It actually says to us that he consented, that is the steward appointed under Ashpenaz, he consented with them in this matter. So Daniel got his way. And why did Daniel get his way? Because God had given him favor, you see. That's what verse 9 says, favor and goodwill with the chief of the eunuchs. And when you have favor, then you have influence. When God gives you favor with people, then you have influence with them. If you aren't favorably disposed toward them, they will not allow you to influence them. But God had done this for Daniel. That's why Proverbs 16 verse 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so Daniel is experiencing this. He makes a request. It, it's a request that could have gotten Ashpenaz killed, but nevertheless, Ashpenaz acquiesces. He, he considers it and he obliges Daniel in his request because God had given Daniel favor. You see, Daniel basically convinced Ashpenaz, why don't you just go ahead and, and, and put it to a test? You know, why don't you just go ahead and give me vegetables, 10 days, that's all I'm asking, 10 days, vegetables and water. By the way, in the Hebrew, the word vegetables also can translate grains, so it wasn't just strictly celery and carrots, all right? But he says, why don't you just go ahead and give me the vegetables and water while all the other guys are eating pasta and, they're, and you know, they're drinking the wine and, and they're eating, you know, uh, blizzards at Dairy Queen. And you watch at the end of 10 days and you take a look and see who's healthier, you know, and who's, and who's more ripped and ready. And so that, and Ashpenaz says, okay, I'll give you 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, at the end of 10 days, look at verses 15 and 16 again at verse 15. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh. In other words, it just means that they looked healthy. They didn't put on weight eating salads, but they just looked healthier, not gaunt. than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies, verse 16, thus the steward took away their portion, this is interesting, took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now, Bible scholars are divided on what verse 16 means. It either means that when Ashpenaz saw that it worked for Daniel and his friends, that instead of it just being a 10-day experiment, he extended it permanently for them. But other Bible scholars believe that it might mean that when Ashpenaz looked at Daniel and these four guys and thought, 
you guys look really good. And looked at the other guys eating all the delicacies, like, you guys look really sad, you're, you're flabby, you know, what's wrong with you? That he took away all of their delicacies too and made them eat rabbit food. Now, we don't know for sure, but that would have been a bad day, wouldn't it, for you? If you're, if you're just like, wait, what happened to the buffet? You know, I was just ready for some pulled pork barbecue. What happened? Oh, uh, you're eating vegetables from now on. Why? These four guys, you can thank them. <laughs> but it's influence. It's influence. And they had influence because they had favor. And they had favor because God had given it to them. And God gave it to them because they honored God and glorified God with their lives. And that's the way it works. I've heard countless stories over the years in ministry from people who were facing a difficult challenge of some sort on the job or at home or at school, somewhere that involved a difficult meeting or a difficult conversation of some kind that went smoother than expected and the outcome was better than expected because God had given them favor with the other party. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard. You know, somebody asking me, hey, can you pray for me? I got to have, I, you know, I, I'm going to ask for this promotion. I need a raise. And I don't know, my boss is either going to look at me and say, you know, sorry, no more room for you here. Or, you know, I hear stories. And then people come back and say, you won't believe it. You know, my, my boss gave me a promotion and even more money than I thought. I mean, it's just that kind of a thing. And not that, again, that it's all about money. It's not all about, you know, money and life. But I'm just giving you examples of when people have testified to me in different situations at work, at home, uh, at school, where, where they had a difficult conversation and how much better it went. Why? Because God gave him favor. Why does God give us favor? Because we walk in a way that honors him and glorifies him, and thus we have influence. In Psalm 5, verse 12, it says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. The righteous. This is what God does for the righteous. You see different examples of this in the Bible. The story of Joseph in the Old Testament of Genesis. Joseph was a young man who had been betrayed by his family, by his brothers, sold into slavery, left for dead, and God took care of him, God rewarded him, and God used him. That's the way it works, because Joseph was a man of integrity, that he honored God and he lived for God, even though, in a similar way, he was thrust into an environment that he had no intention of going to, but sold into slavery to the Midianites by his own brothers, who wanted to just do away with him, ends up in Egypt, rises to basically the right-hand man of Pharaoh, becomes the most powerful man next to Pharaoh in the world, and God promoted him, used him, blessed him, all because Joseph was a man of integrity. The Bible says in Genesis 39, 2-4, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, meaning Potiphar. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Esther is another example in Esther chapter 2, verse 15, the queen of Persia in a similar situation as Daniel. In fact, the story of Esther overlaps the story of Daniel. And in Esther 2, 15, it says, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Why? Because she was a woman of integrity who lived to honor God and glorify him. Jesus, even it says about him in Luke 2, 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. They had influence because they had God's favor, and they had God's favor because they walked in a way that honored Him and glorified Him. Number two, they also were given by God insight. Still here in chapter 1, let me read again, verses 17 to 21. Verse 17 says, and for these four young men God gave. Notice, this wasn't just book knowledge. God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. You can underline that, by the way, because going forward, the book of Daniel is all about visions and dreams. There are a total of six visions and dreams that he has that have interpretation with it that the Lord gives him. In verse 18, now at the end of the days when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. And thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Why was it that they were 10 times better? Because they had been enlightened. They had insight from God. See, it's not just about book knowledge. We need insight and wisdom from above. 
Daniel understood it in his day. I hope that you understand it in your day. We need God's wisdom. We need his insight into things. So they were the smartest guys in the room for sure. Now, I'm not suggesting that just become a Christian, you're going to be the smartest guy or the smartest woman in the room. All right, there's plenty of smart people, and, 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 and in terms of smartness, doesn't have anything to do with whether you're a Christian or not, okay? But what I will say, by the way, it is ironic, however, that the world thinks that if you're a Christian, you're actually the dumbest person in the room. Okay, so we know that, right? That's what they think. So I'm not going to swing to the other extreme and say, but yeah, well, as a Christian, you're actually the smartest person. No, but I will say this, that I believe being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, having a relationship with Him, thereby having the Spirit of God within you, gives you insight and wisdom into matters and situations and people that you otherwise would not have without the Spirit of God. Okay? Now, I, you know, I've said this before, you know, one of the most influential men in, in my lives growing up when I first became a Christian when I was 15 was a guy by the name of Buck Lewis had a third grade education, but that in terms of knowledge, but that guy was one of the wisest men I'd ever met because as a man who loved Jesus and just, you know, just, you know Jesus just constantly was spilling out from this man. There was, there was an insight and wisdom into situations, into life, into matters that did not come because of his education. The guy had a third grade education. So all I'm suggesting is that we may not be the smartest person in the room in terms of knowledge, but knowledge without wisdom and insight is just more information. And I don't know about you, but we are inundated with information. This is the information age, and it hasn't made us any wiser. It might have made us smarter, but again, all the amount of knowledge without insight and wisdom is just superfluous information. You know, if you think that one more book is going to help your marriage, if I just read one more book, it's going to help my marriage. If I just have, what are you saying? If you just have more information, and please, let me just say this, because I just know over 32 years of life and ministry, um, the difference between men and women in some areas, ladies, ladies, listen to me on this, if you think that you can just leave that marriage book on the coffee table and he might read it, <laughs> he won't. <laughs> if I just leave this Christian marriage book right here on the coffee table, if I just slightly push it there, put it there, yeah, just put it there. When he sits to watch the Redskins today at one o'clock, <laughs> instead, he's gonna pick up that book going to turn off the TV and he's going to read it. No, he won't. He's going to use it as a coaster. All right. He isn't going to read it. Now, again, is there anything wrong with more information, more knowledge, more books? No, read books. But I'm telling you what, if we don't have insight and wisdom from above, all all of that is just more information. Another book is not going to help you with the problem you're having with your with your kids. Another book is not going to solve the problem on the job. Another book is not going to give you an answer to God's will. What we need is wisdom and insight from above. And that's what God gave them because these guys were walking in a way that honored God and glorified God. And when we live in such a way, God cares for us, blesses us, and uses us. And so they were given insight here. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 to 31 says, But of him you are in Christ who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And so we have wisdom from above because we have the Spirit of God. We just need to pray and ask God to just unfold that insight and wisdom in our lives that we would then be guided and governed more by his wisdom and insight than just information. So make sure that you recognize where your wisdom and insight comes from and give God the proper glory instead of thinking you are that smart. It's from, it's from God. The third and final thing that God gave Daniel was interpretation. Now, this comes from chapter 2, and I'm only going to read a couple of verses from chapter 2. Next week, we're going to spend more time in chapter 2 actually talking about the specifics concerning the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has and what it means. 
That is for next week. But for today, on this third point, I just simply want to talk about the backstory to chapter 2 and how God gives Daniel this interpretation. So here's the backstory. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has a dream. And the dream is so troubling to him that he can't sleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night. I'm sure we've all had dreams like that. And then he can't get back to sleep. And he's so tormented and troubled by it that he calls in a group of... Now, different translations you'll notice in the first few verses of chapter 2 use different words. Astrologers, sorcerers, enchanters, Chaldeans. Chaldeans is just a broad term that means wise men. So these were, these were people who were um, uh, counselors to the king who had special... Um, knowledge and special abilities to discern things. Now, I will tell you that based on the words that are used in the Hebrew, like astrologers, enchanters, sorcerers, the, the, the basis for their insight and knowledge was demonic. Um, you, you can trace, this is just an historical fact, you can trace all occult worship today back to its roots in ancient Babylon. All Occult worship today can be traced back to ancient Babylon. So this is where they, they didn't just study the, the stars like astronomy. They worshiped the stars, astrology. Let, let me just say, you know, all the zodiac stuff and the horoscopes and, and if you're into those things and tarot cards and all this kind of stuff, trying to discern and omens and all that stuff, it's just demonic and you need, you need to stop looking at that kind of stuff. I'm just telling you. And, and so those, that was the basis behind these guys. So these enchanters, astrologers, these diviners, these sorcerers. Nebuchadnezzar calls them all in like, guys, I've had this dream. It's been very troubling to me. I, I want you to tell me what it means. And so they're in his chambers there and they're like, okay, well, why don't you first tell us what the dream is and then we'll, uh, we'll tell you what the interpretation is. And he's like, no, 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 no. No, I really want to know that you guys are legit. You tell me what my dream was and the interpretation. We're like, ah. Uh. Uh, nobody can do that, King. You know, it's kind of an unreasonable request. You know, why don't you just go ahead and think it through, slow down, think it through. Give us the dream, and then we'll give you the interpretation. He says, I'm not going to tell you again. You're just stalling for time. And if you don't give me the dream and the interpretation, I'm going to have every, this is in the Bible, I'm going to have every single one of you cut into little cubes, put on shish kebab sticks. Look at that part I added. <laughs> but cut into little cubes and all of your houses burned to the ground. And these guys are like, we don't, we don't have the ability to do this. So, okay. So they're, they're put in the blender and off they go. Well, the king says, I want you to go around killing, not just the guys who were in the chambers, but you go find all the wise men, astrologers, enchanters, enchanters, and you go kill them all. And so he sent messengers to go kill everybody. Now, Daniel, because he's come through this program, is considered in this class of wise men. Now, he doesn't tap into any of the demonic stuff. He's head and shoulders above all that, standing alone for Christ and with his, with his three buddies. But, but the guy comes to his door and, and Daniel's like, yeah, can I help you? Yeah, I've been sent for the, from the king. Great, what, for what purpose? To kill you. What? Yeah, see, you missed the meeting. You didn't get the email, but there was a meeting back at the king's palace. And, uh, and all those guys are dead now, and because you're in that category, you're gonna die too. So Daniel says to the guy, whoa, whoa, before, before you cut me into cubes, would you mind if I went and, go and, and talked to the king? Again, he, he gets favor. The guy says, okay, go talk to the king. He goes to the king, he says, king, king, listen, before you kill me, um, can you just give me a little bit more time? You know what's interesting? Nebuchadnezzar didn't give any of the original wise men time. He just cut off their heads. But with Daniel, because he has the favor from the Lord, he says, I'll give you some time, but you have to tell me the dream and the interpretation. And Daniel goes back to his house where he, he, his roommates are, Hananiah, Ezra, and Mishael. And the first thing that he does is he calls a prayer meeting. Look here, chapter 2, verse 16. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven. We're going to pray, guys, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, a dream, so Daniel blessed the God 
of heaven. Notice with me, if you would, your attention again. The first thing Daniel does when he thinks he could be dying is he calls a prayer meeting. He prays. What's the first thing you do when you think you're dying? You Google. <laughs> Am I right? Come on, let's be honest. Like, I've had an eye twitch for three weeks. Let me Google this. <laughs> oh my gosh, I've got a brain tumor. No, you just haven't been getting enough sleep. Get off Google and pray. And Daniel, first thing he does is he prays. It's often the last thing we do. Have you ever noticed that? After you have Googled and gotten yourself more anxious than before, talk to your friends who have relayed some rare isolated story of, of their former mailman's girlfriend who, who died this way from, from that rat bite, you know, and that you think you... Then we get ourselves all wound up in a knot, and then we finally pray. Oswald Chambers said, quote, we tend to use prayer as a last resort, but God wants it to be our first line of defense. We pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. Pray. When Daniel was confronted with this situation, he, ne he needed an interpretation to all of this. And so he prayed. So should we. Whatever confronts us. When you have questions in life, pray. When you have fears about something, pray. When you're anxious about something, pray. When you need wisdom and insight about something, pray. When you're afraid of the future, pray. When you cry about the past, pray. When you need to know God's will, pray. Pray continually. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray and let God give you the answer that you need. Daniel then praised the Lord after the Lord gave him an answer. And so we'll close by looking at his words of praise here in chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God, my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Lord, we thank you and we worship you and we glorify you as Daniel did. We pray, Lord, that we would be men and women and young people who live a life in such a way that it honors you and glorifies you, and then you will take care of us, you will bless us, you will use us. Just as you did in the lives of these four young men, Lord, do in our lives as you find us faithful when we walk with you, trusting you, living for you, in a world that's constantly trying to squeeze us into its mold, we pray, Lord, that you would look at our lives and be pleased. That though these guys were living in Babylon, Babylon was never allowed to live in them. Help us, Lord, in our own day-to-day -day living. That as we walk with you and live for you, that you would be glorified in all things. Thank you, Jesus, we pray in your precious name. And everybody said... Amen and amen. God bless you all.